Brave, loyal, honest. The embodiment of the best of British. These were the qualities cinema audiences saw in Sir John Mills and made him one of our most successful and durable actors. Over a 70 year career, he starred in more than 100 movies. He was honored for his services to the film industry with a knighthood and a CB, won an Oscar, and helped his daughters, Haley and Juliet, become successful actors themselves. Performing was something Johnny always wanted to do, as he explains here in an interview at the National Film Theatre in 1973. If we can um, start more or less at the beginning with your career, because I know your father was a mathematics teacher. How did you, in fact, first make up your mind that you had to be an actor, that, that this was the only life Well, I you? never wanted to be anything else, and it's rather strange because um, my sister, Annette, was a uh, marvellous character. Because this is a lovely muffin the middle Yes, lady, that's right, isn't and she it? was yes. a fabulous dancer before that. And, brought the Charleston and the Black Bottom over to England from New York, and she was a super character. She's dead, unfortunately. And I always thought she was the greatest, and I suppose looking at her from afar, I thought, that's marvellous, that life. But I never remember wanting to do anything else but act, which is rather strange, because my father was a schoolmaster and a terrible ham. Mm. I mean, he read the lessons in the church on Sunday, and it was really Irving, you know, it was a terrific performance. And the only other link I had with the theatre, my mother, for some time, we were always very hard up, was manager of the Haymarket uh, Theatre in the box office. But th that's it, and I can't trace anything back to my family at all. And I never remember ever wanting to do anything but act. I suppose the um, first important starring part you had would have been Brown on Resolution, would it? Um, yes, it was. It was, and I, I went for an interview. And uh, do stop me if I'm running on, will you? Um, I went it for an interview. Your naval career, it started didn't the naval it? career. I went for an interview with um, Walter Ford, who was directing it, and Tony Asquith was doing the second unit. And um, I turned up at the studio and had an interview with Walter Ford. And he looked at me and said, "Yes, you're a very nice-looking young chap." He said, "But you don't look like a sailor." And that's the absolute truth. So I went to Monty Berman, who's a great friend of mine. He was just starting his father's, you know, in his father's business, Berman's the, the costume is. And I said to Monty, "I haven't got any money." He said, "Will you lend me a sailor suit?" And he said, "Certainly." So he fitted me out with a tiddly. I went back to the studio, saw Waterfield, and I said, it's me. You remember John Mills yesterday? He said, ah, oh, yes, he said. Yes, he said, you do look a bit like a sailor. That's right, he said, do a test. I did a test and got the part. For the next uh, 10 or 15 years, anyway, you played a lot of service heroes or in-service films and that, either comedies or, or yes. serious wartime films. And in fact, I think like several other actors at the time, you. Jack Hawkins, people like this, you, you tended to be typecast in that yes. kind of role. How difficult was it to break away I out think very. of the mould, in mm, fact? It was difficult. Yes. Because, it was difficult yes, to break partly, away. Partly, I suppose, because these films were so popular in Britain at the time. And yes, and, and, and at that time, they were needed and they were, they were you mm. know, everybody wanted to see them. Yes. And I enjoyed making them very much, because um, I'd been in the service and worked with the boys and... Uh, I like to think that I was doing something mm. uh, to, mm. to put them up on the screen more or less as they were. Mm. And, uh, but um, it, it was difficult. The first time you played opposite your own family, this distracted you at all? Yes, it distracted me insane. <laughs> I found that it was a devastating experience uh, with uh, Miss Haley Mills, for instance, um, in Tiger Bay. Uh, she, she was persuaded, to, she wasn't persuaded to do the picture, she said finally she wanted to do it. And uh, we started uh, shooting on one morning and Lee Thompson was directing the picture. And um, I don't know whether you saw the film, but there's one scene in it when she's sitting in a rocking chair and she's eating caramels. A very, very difficult thing to do. It would have phased a lot of very professional actors, all the business with the caramels and, uh, you know, lines coming out and pauses and rocking and the whole bit. And we used to tell Haley the, the, the scene, explain what was happening to her, and then let her go with it. Well, she started on this fantastic exhibition, and I dried up three times in the middle. I couldn't believe what was happening. And you could put the camera there, and she was never phased by it. It was just extraordinary. It was like a natural thing happening. And Lee, and he wouldn't mind me telling this story, had um, been on the wagon for about two years, because he loved the grape very dearly, like I do. And um, at about 12.30 that morning, he suddenly said, break, cut, 
lunch. Everybody go to lunch. And I knew we didn't break too well. And I said, well, something wrong, Lee? And he said, no. He said, uh, just break, that's all. Just, just tear it up, break. He said, Haley, go and have a lunch with the Guardian. He said, and Johnny, come to the bull. Come to the bull at Beaconsfield with me. So we sat in dead silence in the car and drove to the bull, walked to the bar, and he said to the barman, I want a dot bottle of Dom Perignon, please. So I thought, that's very strange. He hasn't had a drink for two years. He said, Dom Perignon, open it up, two glasses. He poured two glasses out. And he raised his glass and he said, this has been the most exciting morning of my entire career. And I'm going to drink the whole of this bottle and not have another drink till the picture's finished. And he did. <laughs> did you see anybody come out of number four, the, the Polish lady's flat? Who was it? A man? Mm. And what did he look like? Can you, uh, can you describe him to us? Now, come on, speak up. And don't go telling the superintendent none of your stories or you'll find yourself in real trouble. Proper little liar she is, sir. I uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, not to call the child names. Now then, Gilly, you were going to try and tell us what the man looked like. He just looked ordinary. Was he, uh, dark or fair? Fairish. Fat? Fat? Well, fatish. Was he tall or short? Tallish. How was he dressed? Just an ordinary sort of clothes. A bit like yours. Did he have a hat? Mm. Then how do you know he was fair? He had in his hand. In the house, you see. Do you think you'd recognize him if you saw him again? Yes, I think so. Gracious, look at the time. She should be in the church by now. Let's see now. He was fattish, fairish, tallish, ordinaryish. Thank you very much, Gilly. You've been a great help. Was she conscious of she, you as father? She wasn't conscious or... of anything. I mean, she was, yes. you know, no, was a complete nitwit at the time. <laughs> and uh, she, she was she hummed all the time. She would be, Lee would be saying, now, Haley, dear, now, see, what's going to happen here? The detective, that's your father's doing. She'd go, hmm. And I was jealous. I said, yeah, Haley, you know, listen. He said, let her keep humming, dear. It's great. <laughs> uh, when making films with your members of your family, do you prefer to act or direct? Well, um, I enjoyed directing um, Haley. I think less than I enjoyed acting with her because I was. Then I became very conscious the fact that uh, I had an enormous responsibility to her. Whereas when I was on the same level as an actor, I, didn't, I wasn't too concerned with it, but I would have sleepless nights wondering whether um, my emotion, the emotional side, because she was my daughter, I was being tough enough and strict enough with her. So I didn't get the same enjoyment with her. I enjoyed the whole film uh, more than anything I've ever done. And um, uh, it's a great uh, disappointment to me that um, I didn't pull it off commercially. I mean, it was a tremendous flop. I mean, really one of the big ones. I mean, you could have fired a shotgun in any Odin and not hit an usher. <laughs> and it was a pity because um, I think it was quite well done. Uh, it was quite well written by um, Mary Haley Bell. It was an advanced case of nepotism, I may say, because Haley was in it and I directed it. Don't go away, not yet. Oh, don't you go home. Not yet. I'll get used to it, won't I? It's hard life. People ever actually you to be on your way. George, yours don't like us. I never did. Oh, we don't do him no harm. You only a bit of poaching. If you want it, I'd even try to be asked to Ella. Just don't want you to leave me. That's all I know. Uh, but I think we, it's, uh, this business is largely to do with timing. And we really mistimed this one, but great. We thought that the moment had come to present the world with a sweet love story. And they were waiting for bums and breasts. And we really hit the wrong moment. I mean, it was just not the right moment. I think really probably that was why it didn't succeed. I had the privilege of working with Johnny in three films. One was Ice Cold in Alex directed by Lee Thompson, in which we had a slightly naughty scene where three buttons on my shirt came undone and the subsequent photos 
became very famous. I had this tremendous romance, a big scene, didn't I, with uh, Sylvia Sims. And think how scenes have changed. I mean, we were rolling about in the sand, and um, I think it was um, Lee Thompson said, you know, well, uh, it's a good scene, a quite passionate scene. He said to Sylvia Sims, why don't you undo two buttons on your shirt, right? So he said, OK, so she undid them. And, and I think that didn't get through. I think it was too much. The two buttons were undone. Mm. And only about down to here. So mm. it's changed slightly, hasn't it? A little it's bit, it's... a little bit. Actually, uh, looking at stills, it's a little more than two buttons as well. Is it? But uh, nevertheless, well, the maybe, point is Maybe taken. the stills, sneak the stills through. I don't. She'll know what she wants. If it's poor, nothing you do will make the slightest difference. If it's you, I think you should know by now. And I thought we rode around rather well. It and it was, uh, was ice cold in Alex, and uh, it was too daring, and it was cut out. <laughs> and that was the only really sort of violently exciting love scene I've ever had. <laughs> If John had missed out on romantic roles, it made no difference to his astonishing success. Here he is on Parkinson in 1976, just after he received a knighthood from the Queen. You got used to people addressing you as Sir John? <clears throat> no, not really. I, I, I forget from time to time. Um, um, I must say that I'm um, terribly thrilled about it. I've um, always been very, very keen on prizes. Um, I remember a great moment when I won a toast rack for 100 yards under 40 in Norwich High School. And I thought that was terrific, but I think this is better. Yeah, <laughs> you could be right. How young were you, uh, John? Because you've been in the business an awful long time. Yes. How young were you when you were first fired with the urge to go on stage? Well, I think it's about uh, five or six. I was about five or six years old. I've, uh, I suppose the, uh, one of the greatest pieces of luck that I've had is that I've never really wanted to do anything else. No. I've always wanted to be, to be an actor. But in fact, you did something else, didn't you? I mean, you didn't go straight into... I mean, you, you <laughs> had jobs before you... Yes, yes, I did. Yes, mm. I was in the uh, a corn merchant's office in Ipswich uh, for three years, licking a few stamps. And uh, then I uh, dashed off to London with a fibre, and I got a job as a, a commercial traveller for the Sanitas company. Sanitas? Sanitas, yes. And um, I sold door to door. What did you sell door to door? Well, I sold um, various things, um, um, uh, uh, disinfectant and soap, and, uh, of course, uh, the big number was, uh, was the toilet paper. And that I found rather difficult. Uh, I found the demonstrations were rather, <laughs> rather awkward. And it was their very, big, uh, their very big thing, and they needed... They wanted to sell a lot of this stuff. And uh, I'd been on the road for about um, three months or so and was doing very badly, because uh, in the afternoon I cheated. I uh, took dancing lessons, and uh, I uh, worked very hard, and I didn't work very hard at the selling. And uh, uh, after about three months, the managing director called me up and said, look, this is not any good, he said. I mean, you've got to do better. Uh, choose your best territory, where you think you can do your best work, and take a day, and come back with some sales. So I um, went to Guildford, where I'd had a little success, but not much, and uh, there was a pub there, now, I dumped the case, because it's no good going in with a bag, and I had a bowler hat and an umbrella and a case full of stuff. So I left that in the GM, which I paid five pounds ten for, and um, went into the pub, and uh, the boss was there, and I said, good morning. He said, good morning, sir, what would you like? And I said, what would you like? And uh, he said, a half a bitter. And I said, thank God, I had about two shillings in my pocket. So we had half a bitter, and we chatted up, and he said, uh, what do you do? So I, I took a deep breath and I said, well, as a matter of fact, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm a commercial traveller. He said, uh, well, where's your bag? I said, well, it's, <laughs> it's outside. And the said, well, go and get it. He said, bring it in. So I said, good. So I rushed in with a bag. And he said, well, what is it? And I told him. And uh, I demonstrated the uh, sprays and I demonstrated the soap and I, I told him what he could tack up in the little room and all this sort of thing. And then came the great moment with the, with the paper. And I did my best. I mean, I really worked awfully hard at it and uh, explained as well as I could, you know. And he was fascinated by this. And I must have taken about 30 minutes of his time. And I said, now, sir, what do you think? And I produced the, the pad and the, and the pencil ready for the audience. He said, well, he said, you know, young man, he said, uh, 
He said, I've had a lovely time, he said. I've had a fascinating affair. He said, I must disappoint you, though. I said, why? He said, well, he said, uh, there are 36 pages in Daily Mail. <laughs> and, of course, I could see, you know, the little squares cut up. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, I, uh, yes, I know what you mean. <laughs> I once went into a, into, a, into a toilet in a pub, and there's one piece of paper, and it had my name on it. It was a column from the Sunday Times. <laughs> right. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah. Absolutely true. <laughs> one left. My God, <laughs> a terrifying thing to ask any man to do that. Yeah. Yeah. John, how did you become, in fact, though, a song and dance man? Because that's how you started. Not a lot of people would know that, I imagine. Well, um, I started off because uh, it was my ambition to be a song and dance man. And my great hero was uh, Fred Astaire and uh, Bobby Howes. So I was determined to get into that, that area. And um, after I got the sack from the Santos Company, um, I um, went to a dancing academy opposite the uh, Sejo of the Hippodrome and learned tap dancing and um, with the idea of getting into the chorus. And at this, uh, at the academy, was um, a very um, voluptuous young blonde called Francis Day, mm. who was quite a character. And um, we heard there was an audition for a show called The Five O'Clock Girl at the Hippodrome. And I was going to give an audition, so was she. And I said, well, we'll just line up. She said, oh, no. No, that's no good. We've got to impress Mr. Gillespie, who owned the theatre. He said, she said, I won't do an audition like that. I'll just, I must go into a bill, a proper bill. He said, and there's, there's, there's a bill on New Cross Empire, and he owns that, and we will do an act together, a double act on, on the bill. So she managed this. I mean, how she did it, I don't know. I couldn't have done it. But eventually we turned up to New Cross Empire with this little act we worked on, singing a very nice boy and girl number. And uh, we were waiting in the wings. I was, I'd borrowed some tails and had a five and nine pink makeup on, and Francis was on the other side of the stage. And um, the Nesbitt brothers were on. Now, that was a really rough house, the New Cross Empire. I'm talking about 1929. Mm -hmm. And the Nesbitt brothers were doing an act with the ukuleles. And suddenly, all hell broke loose, and they got the most terrific raspy. I mean, really <laughs> loud bird was going on, and the audience went up in flames. And as Max passed me, waiting in the wings, he said, they want blood tonight. Now, that was a start. Now, Frances had, had an idea that uh, her bulldog should come on and sit at our feet while we were singing this number. And I was rather anti that, because though I was very new at it, I knew that animals were dangerous. So she persuaded me. So we started this number, and the audience was sort of stunned silence. They couldn't, they, we were not on the bill, we were not put in the program, and we were there singing this extraordinary young duet together. And the bulldog padded on and sat at uh, Francis's feet. Then a titter started. And the titter grew and grew and grew and grew. And I looked down in this enormous laugh, and the bulldog was piddling on the foot. <laughs> <laughs> well, to the end that story up, I mean, uh, Francis didn't get in, but I got a job in the chorus, and that's how it started. Really? Mm. What about the bulldog? Did that get a job? <laughs> I don't know what happened there. <laughs> Must have been a fairly rough, hard old life, that I would imagine. Uh, well, it, it, yes, it was. Uh, I, I loved every minute of it. Mm. Uh, we got four pounds a week, and I paid 10% to my agent, 10% uh, to the Dancing Academy to teach me to dance. And I had three pounds four left, and I lived quite well uh, in Lambeth at seven and six a week, bed and breakfast. And uh, I did toss up whether to go and see Spencer Tracy or eat, and Tracy won, as a rule. <laughs> but I, I, I managed. Yes. Which, in fact, do you prefer doing? You're going back on stage now, but you've done an awful lot of work in, in, in movies. The majority of your career has been spent in movies. Do you prefer stage work or movie work? Well, you can't really compare the, the enjoyment. Um, the theatre has a magic which uh, the studios don't. Um, I mean, I get an enormous thrill uh, every time I walk through a stage door. Uh, but I don't get a kick walking through stage five at Pinewood. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a different sort of thing altogether. Yes. I think that um, this marvellous character, um, Sir Ralph Richardson, who tears up the M1 on a motorbike, you know, with a helmet, he was asked that question, you know, which, uh, which do you prefer, and how do you explain it? And he said, well, I can't do it, because uh, all the young actors do it, and so well. But this is, this is what he said to me. He said, well, uh, when I'm at the studios, and I, they say you're finished, uh, I dash to my dressing room, I'm taking my jacket off, it's on the way, I tear my tie off, I'm undoing my trousers, I kick my shoes off. He said, I'm on my motorbike in about um, 42 seconds flat. He said, but when the curtain comes down at the Haymarket or somewhere, I leave the stage, I wander to my dressing room, 
I put my dressing gown on, I have a drink with some friends, I think, well, shall I take my makeup off? And I do that. Then we have another chat, and then I light my pipe, and then I walk down to the stage, and there's a pilot light, and everybody's gone, and I look round the theatre and think that's rather nice, and then I wander out through the stage door. It takes me about an hour, and I think that's the difference. Yes. And I think that really says it. I think it's the, it is the magic of the theatre. Yes. Despite that love of theatre, the movie acting never stopped, not even on his 70th birthday. Well, most septuagenarians would spend their 70th birthday quietly at home. But for Sir John Mills, it was a normal working day. Here, shooting a scene at Cadogan Pier, Chelsea, with Timothy West for the film The 39 Steps by John Buchan. Mills plays a British agent desperate to alert the government to the dastardly plot he has uncovered. Timothy West is an unbelieving cabinet minister. Does nothing to strengthen your hand, you know. So you're all prepared to ignore the obvious warnings. I'll do what I can for you. For my case. Well, don't be so touchy. I'm not in this for my pride. A break for lunch, and when the smoke cleared, I made contact with Sir John. Sir John, first of all, happy birthday. Thank you very much, Bob. Seventy. Yes, it's ridiculous. Well, you don't it? look it. Presumably, you don't feel it. Well, I really don't. No, I really don't. Very nice hat, too. <laughs> they trimmed it. Did they? And I got no face, you see, and it was out there, and they took an inch off, so it doesn't look a bit better. <laughs> so, John, we looked you up. You've made something over 100 films. Well, I think it is, yes. Yeah. I think it is. Very difficult question. Uh, any favourite film amongst those? Well, I'm thinking quickly. Um, uh, Ryan's Daughter, I think, was one, because I had no lines to learn. Well, that was extraordinary, because you got an Oscar, didn't you? Yes. yes. And, and you played a deaf mute. Yes, yes. I mean, it's extraordinary after a long acting career where you're really pushing it out. It's ironical, really, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But it was uh, great fun to do, and uh, it was working with David Lean again. And I hadn't worked with David for about, well, many, many years. And I'd made five with him, I think, in which we serve and Hobson's Choice and Expectations and all those early ones. Yes. So it was... Um, Nice to get back with David again. Any other? I mean, I, there's so many that come to mind, but Tunes of Glory is one. That... Well, that was one that I, I did enjoy making, because Alec um, uh, Guinness is a great chum, and it was one of those nice things that came off, and it worked, and we enjoyed doing it, and I'm, I'm glad you liked that one. Very, very much. You once advised against children ever going on the stage, although your, yours have done so. Would you still give that same advice today, don't do it? Yes. <laughs> Do you still hold to that view? Oh, yes, absolutely, yes. I mean, if anybody says, you know, shall I put my daughter on the stage, Mrs. Worthington, I say no, because it's, uh, it's the jungle. Mm -hmm. And um, I always advise people to keep them out. Uh, it, it's very overcrowded anyway, and um, it's, it's a tricky profession to belong to, but it's absolutely marvellous, and I'm very glad that I belong to it. But I wouldn't advise anybody to get into it. But I told my children to stay up, but of course they, they joined the ranks. Yes. Took no notice of me at all. Well, what's the secret? Because unbelievably, your, your first appearance was in 1929. <laughs> yes. Yeah? And you've survived uh, very, very successfully indeed. Um, what's the secret? I mean, to choose very carefully what you do? Or? I think there's a great deal of luck in it. Um, and one has one's ups and downs. But I do think there's a great, a great deal of luck and a great deal of hard work. And uh, there's a certain amount of choice. You do sometimes, if you're lucky, have a choice. And if you back the right horse, it's, it's yes. nice. Well, uh, on your 70th birthday, in fact, I think you want a day off to celebrate, but uh, it didn't work out that way. That's the film yeah, still I'm imagine. working, which is nice. Which is lovely. Will you go on and on working? I mean, uh... Well, I mean, I have to if I want to live here. Yes. And I do want to live here, and I don't want to move out. And uh, there's no way of stopping. Well, now, there have been various versions of the 39 Steps. Yes. Marvelous story. Yes. Uh, do I take it, Sir John, this is going to be the best version? Well, I think that... I do think that it's a wonderful script. I think that they've gone back to the book, uh, it, and it is one of the best books of its type, I think, ever written. I remember vaguely the Bob Donat version, and uh, he was a wonderful man. I knew him very well, made a picture with him. Uh, the second one I didn't see. But uh, I, I thought this script, when I read it, was really perfect. Well, look, we've kept you standing in the cold. You've been in the cold all morning. You're going off to have a birthday lunchtime drink, are you? Well, not? I think they're open. <laughs> <laughs> but look, very happy birthday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ten years later, 
and John had long achieved national treasure status, and the interest in his career and how it got started was still there. Here he is being interviewed by Richard Baker for the programme My Favourite Things. Well, then your way back into the profession again came through Noel Coward, didn't you? Yes, it? yes. He, um, he wrote a marvellous part called Shorty Blake uh, in uh, a picture called In Which We Serve, which was David Lean's first job, co-directed it with Noel. And um, I think one of my favourite things is the Navy, and also a, a marvellous man called... Um, Lord Louis Mountbatten, who was one of the greats, as, as you know. And uh, I was privileged to know him quite well. Started off with In Which We Serve, and then I made three or four more pictures with the Navy at that time. And he said to me one night at dinner, um, you know, Johnny, um, you were a brown job, weren't you? <laughs> you were in the army. And I said, yes, I was. He said, well, I, I think really you should join the Navy. And I said, how do you mean, sir? He said, well, I think you should join the Kelly. So, um, you know, the Kelly was the destroyer that he, his lovely, lovely ship, which we, in which we serve, was about. So he made me a member of the ship's company. He, he gave me the ship's tie, which I'm now wearing. I always wear it on these occasions. And I went to the reunion dinner every year, and he gave me a plaque with the Kelly crest on it, which I have on the, uh, the door of the loo, because the motto is, keep on. So I thought that was quite um, quite appropriate. And uh, so that was a marvellous experience for me. But after the war, you did go back. Yes, I you? did. I did, because Mary, my wife, um, wrote a marvellous play for me called Men in Shadow, which got me back into the theatre. And then she wrote another one, which was an enormous hit, which another very famous man actually played my part. And I found this out this morning. His name is Richard Baker. <laughs> It was a long time ago in a rep in Wales and of no very great consequence, I good must part, say. Good part, though, wasn't it? Oh, I mean, a jolly good part, So yes. that, that was nice, and uh, we did have a very, very big success with it, and which was marvellous for, for Mary. So big she... that uh, some of your friends couldn't even get in to see well, it? Well, yes. Yes, indeed. We, we, um, we were still fairly hard up, and we, we splashed out without knowing whether we had a hit or not and took a suite at the Savoy. And uh, we stayed there, and the notices came out that night, and we read them, and they were absolutely wonderful, rave notices. So we were there in the morning, having breakfast in bed, and looking out over the river, and the sun was shining, and everything was terrific. I was starring in her play, and it co-directed it, and it was just marvellous. And uh, the phone rang at about 11.30, and it was um, Larry Olivia. And he said, well, congratulations, smashing, you've done it, it's Mary's play, and you've acted in it, and I'm not working this afternoon. I'd like to come and see the matinee. I said, wonderful. So I rang the box office and I said, um, it's John Mills, can I have two tickets for the matinee this afternoon? And they said, no. <laughs> I said, well, what do you mean, no? And I'm in the play, you know, John Mills, we want two tickets for Mr. He was then Mr. Olivier. They said, I'm terribly sorry, if it was God, you couldn't get in. And I said, what do you mean? He said, we're sold out. And we were sold out the matinee after we opened. And I remember saying to Mary, well, you know, and here we are in the Savoy, in a suite, there's the sun, it's shining on the river, you've written a play, I'm in it, and Mr. Olivia can't get in. <laughs> what I, more could you well, want I mean, that to had to be one of my favourite things. He was true to his word about that Navy tie. He's wearing it in both these next two pieces, which again focus heavily on the making of Noel Coward's film, In Which We Serve. But to go back to In Which We Serve, that was a marvellous break for me because it gave me a chance to get back after the army into movies. And he wrote Shorty Blake, the part, for me. Uh, this is my wife, Mrs Blake. How do you do? Well, pleased to meet you, I'm sure. One particular time, I think very early days of shooting, they built a wonderful model of the Kelly, a section of it, very, very large section, which would rock 50 degrees each way, had a very big rock on it. And uh, the first day shooting, uh, they'd engaged 100 extras and uh, to, to do the scenes on deck, and at 11 o'clock they were all sick on stage five in Denham. It's absolutely true. <laughs> and uh, so Nell said, well, this won't do, you know, we can't, we can't have this. He rang up Lord Louis. Well, by the three o'clock in the afternoon, we had the real chaps down there. The real sailors, so we shot the scene again with the real chaps who weren't sick. And now the same subject with Alan Titchmarsh in 1994. The scenes I remember that, that stick in my mind for it are of you all swimming around in this 
hideous oh. tank yeah. of what looks almost like black oil. That can't have been fun. Well, it was a ghastly tank. I mean, it was an enormous tank at Denham Studios, and we'd been filming in it for about three weeks. And uh, they threw everything in, diesel oil, soot, mud, muck, tar. It was really horrific. And we'd been filming in this thing for about three weeks. We were all standing, shivering, looking at it one morning, and Noel came out and said, what are you waiting for, chaps? Just get in. And he dived in, came up, covered in diesel oil, and said, Dysentery in every ripple. <laughs> Keep your heads down, get as low as you can. Nice pad of fingers. <coughs> Darn it. I spoke too soon. How did they get the gunshots there? Because there you were, in, which is obviously in a studio, but how the dickens did they get the machine gun fire on the top of the water? Uh, being shot, well, that was a bit tricky. And of course, it's a long time ago, and uh, special effects weren't what they are today. And uh, they didn't know what to do. And they all said, well, we can't use live ammunition. He's only halfway through the film. So <laughs> they, they, they got the property master to gun. This is absolutely true story. He went out into Denham. He went to a chemist, and he bought grosses of what we used to call in those days rather delicately French letters. Brought them back to the studio, and the, and the special effects got a long steel pipe, put it under the water about that far from the top, fitted these things on, one after another like that, blew in, compressed, and went up, like then they got the shot. And uh, <laughs> it, it really worked on that so I really, I'll go down to posterity, it's the only actor to be shot in the arm by contraceptive. <laughs> <laughs> it was a very good shot. Very good shot. But you did have a reputation in those days for not playing cardboard cutout servicemen. I mean, goodness me, you were in the army, you were in the RAF, you were in the Navy, all on film. Yeah. But you played them with a certain kind of naturalness. I mean, did you feel a responsibility to servicemen rather than just playing them as sort of stiff upper lip? Yes, I did. Types? And I, I had been in the service and uh, uh, there was a lot of talk about stiff upper lip at that time. And I thought, well, when I came out of the army, the least I can do is to try and put them up there as best I, I could. And uh, uh, this stiff upper lip thing was a sort of old hat, rather tired thing that was used at the time, they, they were anything but stiff upper lip. I mean, an awful lot was going on inside them. And they were a marvellous lot. I worked with the submariners, all of them, tank boys, paratroopers, a lot. And uh, uh, that sort of acting was, was not easy to do. It was quite difficult. What about playing Michael in Ryan's Daughter, the part that brought you an Oscar, the part where you were barely recognisable? Yeah. <laughs> now, that was the most amazing role to watch, but I guess, guess not the easiest role to get into. Well, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not a method actor, I never have been, but that's the one part that I couldn't get straight in front of the camera and start acting. Uh, it needed a bit of thought before, because he was a very slow thinker, and I had to sort of start thinking, thinking slowly. And I was very lucky, I had a wonderful makeup man called Charlie Parker, and he put this terrific makeup on. It only took 16 minutes in the morning, it was just brilliant. Uh, I mean, he, it's a great uh, piece of resistance with the teeth. And he made these fantastic teeth, which I clipped in. Uh, with the teeth won the Oscars, no doubt about that, <laughs> no doubt. When you're playing a part like that, though, it is, I mean, had you studied people with disabilities? Yes, I had a great friend called Bernard Miles, Lord Miles, who uh, knew a lot of doctors who had film of patients with brain damage on, on the left side. And I looked at a lot of this, and then I made up a a composite picture, of, of Michael was a sort of composite picture, and uh, so at least what I was doing uh, was true. I wasn't just sort of pulling faces. Did you think when you went into this part, this is a real corker? I mean, did your ev eye ever go faintly in the direction of an Oscar when you were doing it? Did you think this is pretty good stuff? Well, uh, it, 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 it didn't really. Um, I enjoyed it thoroughly because I had no dialogue, and so I was always drinking Guinness in the pubs at night when the boys were learning their lines. It, it wasn't until about three quarters of the way through and David leaned suddenly said to me, Nobby, can't you call me Nobby, I don't know why, I said, have you ever had an Oscar? And I said, no. And of course, you know, nine months later, I, I'm lucky enough to get it. Two decades after that Oscar came Britain's highest acting honor, a BAFTA fellowship recognizing John as a uniquely dominant figure in the history of British cinema when he died three years later, aged 97, the tributes called him a great actor, a true gentleman, and someone who made us proud to be British. <laughs>